What's up, future respiratory therapists? In this video, I'm sharing with you just a glimpse of an hour-long presentation I provided today over pneumonia. We did a disease review and we talked all about pneumonia. It's a complicated process, but there are some very specific things we can do to help reduce the risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia, and that's what's in this video. I hope you watch, I hope you learn, I hope you take notes, and ask yourself, does my facility, are we doing the best we can do to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia? Let's dive in. Um, last one here talking about prevention, ventilator associated pneumonia. Uh, we need to keep the patients off the vent as much as possible. So that means utilize non-invasive ventilation when possible. We don't want to just go straight to, to, to invasive mechanical ventilation. Let's try to utilize non-invasive mechanical ventilation if we can keep that patient from having to go on the vent. If they do go on the ventilator, they want to minimize and interrupt sedation. We, 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 I think we've seen what happens and we've seen the effect now. Multiple studies prove it over and over and over. The greater the sedation, the greater the time on the vent, the greater the risk for infection, the greater the risk for mortality. That's proven. So we want to minimize, use the appropriate amount of sedation, not an excessive amount, and also turn it off daily to interrupt it. When we turn it off, we should be performing a spontaneous breathing trial, daily assessment of liberation. This was the craziest thing in the world to me back, I don't know, 12 years ago, when 12, 10 years ago, whenever it was we started doing spontaneous breathing trials. Uh, it was like this patient isn't extubated today. Why are we why are we doing this? And what we found is is that outcomes improve when we assess daily for the readiness for liberation from mechanical ventilation. So important aspect there. Early mobility. This is something I'm very intrigued in and, and interested in. I um I don't know if we're doing it well enough yet, but it, it, it is associated with reduced risk for ventilator associated pneumonia and overall better outcomes. Also, subglottic secretion management. Uh, Egan's goes as far as saying that if you know this patient is going to be on mechanical ventilation for 48 to 72 hours, like you can see it, and we all know those patients we see. We go to intubate this figure, we need to intubate this patient, and we can go, they're gonna be on here for a minute. They're gonna be on here for a couple of days. That's all we were saying, 48 to 72 hours, you're saying they're gonna be on the vent for a couple of days. If you feel that, then you should in input or insert an in the tracheal tube that has the subglottic suction ports on it for improved management of subglottic secretions because we know those secretions sit on top of the cuff and they just migrate down and around into the alveolar units and now we've got ventilator fem associated pneumonia, which also brings us back to proper cuff management. We know we all learned 20 to 30 centimeters of water pressure. Some of us may be the minimal leak test or the minimal occlusion volume. Well, Egan says that those are gone. The minimal occlusion volume and the minimal leak test is not an appropriate cuff management strategy anymore because of that silent aspiration that leaks around the cuff. Evidence says that 30 centimeters of water pressure is the safe area that also reduces that sloughing and silent aspiration around the cuff. Uh, we need to change the ventilator circuits. Only PRN. Only when they are visibly soiled. And if you can coordinate them with a transport or another time of disconnect, then that's even better because you're now reducing the amount of times that the circuit is broken. We open the circuit, we open the patient to environmental pathogens, higher risk for ventilator associated pneumonia. Also head of the bed up 30 to 30, 35 degrees. Again, semi-erect position, supine, not good. Up is much better. That says 30 to 35 degrees. That's a typo. That's supposed to be 30 to 45 degrees. So is up as is, is, is much as the patient will tolerate it has a higher association with reduced ventilator association pneumonia. So get the head of the beds up uh, to help prevent ventilator associated pneumonia. I'm sure you could all talk about your VAP bundles at your hospital um, and, and hopefully you have them. If you don't, this would be a great QI project to look into and go, what does our VAP bundle look like? And is it time to re readdress it and go back and visit it again? Uh, because uh, there's some things that have changed in that. So, so consider that. When it comes to actual treatment of this, we know that um, 
the number one treatment is to figure out the organism and give the appropriate antibiotic therapy. This is key. That's what's going to help beat the infectious process that is happening. Now, we play a role in gathering the sputum to identify the causative agent. So whether this is aerosolizing some sort of saline or assisting with a bronchoscopy or performing a mini bronchialveolar lavage ourselves, we play a role in getting that. Our job is to recognize a quality sample or not. You don't want a lot of oral secretions that taints the ability to, to identify the organism. And so we want a, a healthy sputum sample, which can be challenging because we know, as we stated earlier, some of these patients don't have sputum. They, they're not, they don't have a productive cough. So we try and try and try. It's like, I can't get this person to cough anything, to, to present any sputum. It makes it challenging sometimes. Beyond that, we need to focus on secretion clearance to help get the fluid and the consolidation out of the alveoli. This is gonna be much easier after we're on the appropriate antibiotic therapy. This may be CPT or PEP therapy. Also, autogenic drainage to help the patient um, breathe at different levels to have and to promote a healthier, more effective cough to help mobilize these secretions from the alveoli to the small airways to the large airways where then they can be coughed out and cleared. Now we know we're gonna use oxygen here. We're gonna use oxygen to, to treat the acute hypoxemia. That's the only role we're doing it for. Once we correct the acute hypoxemia, we should be getting the oxygen off of that patient. And then we know mechanical ventilation will also help to support the patient's respiratory system during the infectious process. And when I say mechanical ventilation, I'm saying non-invasive when appropriate and invasive when appropriate. So you have to assess our patients, individualized care to them, what is right for this patient right now that we can best support their respiratory needs to get them through this acute infectious process. That's our treatment plan, and that brings us to the end of this presentation. I'll wrap it up here with some key points. Um, the big problem is the consolidation of the pulmonary units. That's what pneumonia is. The alveoli become consolidated and overwhelmed by this infectious pathogen due to the battle that ensues. We gotta identify the bug to know the drug. Uh, I'm gonna use that from now on for her, sure. But we gotta identify the causative pathogen which will allow us to treat it correctly. Uh, prevention is key, okay? We already talked about that. If we can prevent them from getting sick, then we don't even have to think about fixing them after they get sick. That's not always possible, but that's, the, that's, that's what it is. Secretion clearance, oxygen, and mechanical ventilation. Those are the tools we have in our bag to treat these patients, to take care of them, to get them well um, in, in conjunction with the appropriate antibiotic therapy. I want you to think about something else here real quick before I let you go. It's a pet peeve of mine. This treatment list, Nowhere on there does it say bronchodilators, aerosolized albuterol, or anything like that. This is an alveolar unit, and we're the experts, and we have to be the ones to verbalize this, that we say, you know what this patient needs? Doesn't need this aerosolized medication. It needs this treatment plan, because the, the albuterol does not dry up fluid in the alveoli. It's going to have no effect on that, okay? So um, keep that in mind. So I hope you enjoyed this short segment of this presentation that I got the opportunity to do today. Um, if you did, come join me on the various different social media sites that I'm on. Obviously, you're here on YouTube at Respiratory Coach. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and leave me a comment if you want to ask a question or if you want to leave any concerns or thoughts that you may have about this video. Also, I encourage you to come follow me on Instagram, on TikTok, at Risk for a Coach, and on LinkedIn, at Joe Lewis. I'm right there. I promise you, you'll be able to find it. Send, send me an email, riskforacoach at gmail.com. And then like I left off the conversation today, if you have any questions, reach out to me on any of these sites on this YouTube video, or send me an email to riskforacoach at gmail.com. I would love to continue this conversation and continue uh, working with you and talking with you to inspire you and to promote you to be the very, very best respiratory therapist you can be. Remember, at the end of the day, average is easy. Don't be it.